This year, the International Linguistics Olympiad was held in the Isle of Man. This is part one of a lecture that I gave during the week. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss part two, which will follow shortly. The Celtic Languages In Manx, Nechinyach and Kelchach. The word Celtic is normally pronounced in English with a hard k sound and comes from a Greek word Keltoi, which is mentioned by ancient writers such as Herodotus in the 5th century BC as a people living in the west of Europe. The Romans often called them Galli. So just to be clear, these people are Celtic and these people are Celtic. Now, the Celtic languages have been spoken by Celtic peoples across Europe from the Iron Age uh, up to today, and they're still spoken today. They originated in the middle of Europe, in this yellow area here, which is uh, known as the Hallstatt uh, culture from before 500 BC. Then they gradually spread out east and west across Europe, uh, and we can see that the, it was a quite a vast expanse by the 3rd century BC. But then, over time, they've really retreated to the west of Britain and Ireland and just this west tip of uh, Brittany and France. So the Celtic languages once dominated most of Europe, really, but the territory has shrunk in size uh, considerably over the years. The Celtic languages are part of the Indo-European language family. Proto-Indo-European was spoken about 4000 BC. It started around this area by the uh, Black Sea and spread east and west across Europe and also down into India. Uh, and this family is the ancestor of a, the, a large amount of languages throughout Europe. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And here we can see the branches of the Indo-European language. We have Albanian languages, Anatolian languages, Armenian languages, Balto-Slavic languages, uh, the Celtic languages there, Germanic languages, Hellenic languages, Italic languages, Indo-Iranian languages, and Tocharian languages. Uh, so Celtic languages are actually related to, for example, English, a Germanic language. They're also related to other languages like French and Spanish, but also languages such as Hindi. So to show that the Celtic languages are actually part of the Proto-Indo-European language family, we can illustrate this by looking at some cognate words. Words for very basic concepts are often shared between all the languages or similar, uh, appear similar anyway. So have a think, what could these words be in your language or a language that you speak? In Manx, un, der, tri, kid. Welsh, in thy three cant. Any ideas? Well, the answer is, they are numbers, one, two, three, and a hundred. Okay, here's another one. And the clue I gave in the lecture was that it's an animal. In Manx, taru, and in Irish, this word is pronounced either like Manx, Taru, or like Tarov. Yep, it is a bull. This one's quite easy. The Manx word brer, the Welsh word brawd, or the plural actually, brodir. Yep, it means brother. So, oh, and one more. The Welsh word dant is a tooth as in dentist and things like that. So, despite appearing quite different, the Celtic languages are actually related to lots of European languages. But various things have happened over time and they've gone their own way in, in many ways. So, if we look at the, the Proto-Celtic uh, language, around about 1000 BC, we can divide that in various ways. One common way of dividing this branch, or all the different languages, uh, on this branch at least, is into insular languages and continental languages. So we have Celtiberian that was once spoken in northeast Spain, Gaulish, which was the ancient language in France before the uh, Romans came along, uh, Lapontic, 
which was spoken in the north of Italy, and Galatian, that was spoken in Turkey. Another way of dividing the Celtic languages is into P-Celtic or Q-Celtic. And this is to do with a sound change, a regular sound change that happened in uh, various Celtic languages. Some of them have a P and some of them have a, a K or a Q. So we can illustrate this by looking at a, a word in Proto-Celtic, Makwas, which means son, as in son or daughter. And this, in, uh, in Old Irish, the genitive form at least, the possessive form, was maqui. And in Old Welsh, it would have been something like map. And this has developed into, the maqui has become mac in uh, Manx, Irish and Scottish Gaelic. A very famous word that, probably most famous for the name that means son of Donald. And in Welsh, Cornish and Breton, map has uh, generally become mab, but there are lots of words that have a k uh, in one language and a p in the other language, in the other language group. For example, pen is Welsh for head, and kion is Manx for head, so you've got p and k there. Pedwar is Welsh for four, kier is Manx for four, again a p and a k sound, p and a k sound in the two branches. So we can divide the Celtic languages into Q-Celtic and P-Celtic, depending on how they treat a certain sound or how the sound developed. So here we can see that Old Irish and Celtiberian were Q-Celtic languages, and then the rest, Brythonic, Gaulish, Lepontic and Galatian, were P-Celtic languages. But Gaulish also has a few features of Q-Celtic, so it's kind of a bit of a, a mixture of both of them. Now, the insular Celtic languages have more in common than all the P-Celtic or Q-Celtic languages. They're kind of more similar to each other, really. But also, the continental Celtic languages did not survive, and we don't have as much information about them. Some of them uh, have hardly survived at all. What we do know about the continental uh, Celtic languages is that they, in terms of their grammar, at least, they're, they're quite close to how Latin worked, uh, whereas the insular Celtic languages developed quite differently. We're going to look at one ke uh, continental Celtic language now, Gaulish, which is the, the language that this fellow would have spoken, Asterix. And it was spoken in France before the Romans conquered Gaul, or France, uh, and uh, by the Celtic peoples living there. Gaulish was sometimes written down in either Latin or Greek letters. Often the ancient Celts didn't like writing things down, especially the Druids, they preferred to memorise things, uh, and, uh, and that's why poetry is very important in Celtic cultures, because if something rhymes or has rhythm, it's much easier to remember. So things were often made into poetry to make it easier to remember them. Now, Gaulish, in ancient France there, was very similar to the Celtic language spoken in the Isle of Britain, and Boudicca, the queen uh, of the Iceni or Igeni would, would have spoken an ancient language very similar to the ancient language in Gaul. In fact, the ancient Britons used to help the Gauls fight the Romans a lot of the time, which is probably one of the reasons why the Romans wanted to invade Britain. Here's an example of some words in Gaulish. And here we have the modern Welsh equivalent and the Manx equivalent. Now, the Gaulish doesn't look much like the Manx, but you can see some similarities with the modern Welsh. Both Gaulish and modern Welsh are mainly P-Celtic languages. And what happened was that ancient Brythonic, so the ancestor of Welsh, uh, gradually changed from Brythonic into Welsh. And when that happened, one of the main things that happened was that the word endings dropped off and the consonants in the middle and the end of words got softened. So if we remove the endings of the Gaulish words, we can see now that they, they look much more similar to the, the modern Welsh equivalents. And these are the ordinal numbers, so first, second, third, fourth, fifth, etc. So if we look at the Gaulish word tenth, which is decametos, and we take the ending off and we have decamet, 
then if we soften the constants or unite the constants, so a k becomes a g, uh, a m becomes a v, and a t becomes a d, we get degaved, and then the Welsh, in Welsh, one f is pronounced v, so that's degaved. So we can immediately see that that's developed quite regularly from uh, the the ancient Brythonic, which would have been very similar to the ancient Gaulish into modern Welsh. The Manx, Jeyu, doesn't look anything like that. But if we look at what tenth is in Old Irish, we can see that it would have been something like uh, Dechmad. And this over time would have become something like Dechwad, Jechwad, Jechwa, Jehu, and then eventually Jeyu. So there are similarities between Gaulish and uh, languages such as Manx, as well as with Welsh. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, continental Celtic languages, such as Gaulish, had quite a complex grammar, similar to Latin, and they had cases. So here we can have a look and see the, that the word mapos has different forms depending on what it's doing in the sentence. The normal word is just mapos for a son and mapoi for sons. But if you wanted to say, I see the sun, or I see the suns, then you would have to use the accusative form there, mapon, singlet, mapos, in the plural. Now these look a little bit like Latin, if anybody knows Latin, they will recognise that some of these changes are quite similar, especially the vocative. The vocative is when you address somebody. The most famous phrase in Latin, probably, in the vocative is about Brutus, who uh, attacks Caesar, uh, and Caesar says, and you, Brutus, which is et tu brute, with the us changing to e. And if we have a look at the nominative mapos, we've got an os that changes to e in the vocative mape. Again, so the word mapos is just son or a son or something, and mape is kind of like oi son or hey son, it's addressing the son. So lots of different cases there. Old Irish had cases as well, but not quite as many, and they've gradually got more and more simple. This is the end of part one. Part two will follow shortly. If you want more information about Manx Gaelic or are interested in learning some, see the video description for information about online lessons.